Welcome to Hope Online. We are so glad that you're joining us today, wherever or whenever that may be. If you are new or we haven't had a chance to connect with you yet, we would love for the opportunity to. You can text NEW TO HOPE to 97000. That's NEW TO HOPE to 97000. Today, we're going to be continuing in our Galatians series, so grab your notebook, your Bible, and your pen, and let's learn together. Everybody, Pastor John here. I could not wait to be able to spend some time with you today. I missed you since the last time we've been able to hang out together like this. If you are new to Hope Online, if you are coming to join us for the first time or first few times, welcome. We're really glad you're here. And we view this as a very special, on purpose, intentional time for us to study God's Word together because we know as pastors that's the best way that we serve you along the way is to look into God's Word. If you come to our church all the time, uh, and for some reason something's keeping you away today in person, uh, that, that, that uh, man, we sure do miss you, and we can't wait to see you again next week. So, whether you're first time or every time, we're so, so, so thankful that you get to hang out with us today. We get to hang out with you. We are um, just coming off of a couple of big fall events, and we're celebrating like crazy what God did through our Trunk or Treat events, the way we get to serve our city and um, uh, have uh, an amazing opportunity to serve alongside one another. So thank you big time for all of the, the help, all of the volunteering, all of the candy, um, all of the smiles, all the high fives, all of the ways that we got to show the love of Christ to the city and uh, our, our area right here where we live. And so thank you, thank you, thank you. It's, it's November. Okay, have you put up your Christmas stuff yet? How many of you, how many of you are Christmas people already? Maybe, maybe, maybe that's happening. Um, uh, that's okay, that's okay. You gotta enjoy that stuff along the way. Um, uh, we are in a study in the book of Galatians in the Bible. So I wanna invite you to grab your Bible, maybe a notepad, something to write some notes on, and go to Galatians chapter five. Galatians only has six chapters, and we are in chapter five today. Um, we have been in this uh, study in this particular book for uh, many weeks. And uh, what we do is we just take our time going through God's word, see what we can learn from it and how it impacts our life. Now, I read a story about uh, a man in South Africa in, Jan in January 17th, 1934. This man, his name is Jacobus Jonker. That's quite a name. You're going to laugh when you hear his son's name here in a second as well. He was a diamond prospector, but he was discouraged because he just felt like he had a string of bad luck, never finding anything valuable, always coming up empty handed. One on this particular day, January 17th, he decided to stay home. It was cold. It was windy. The night before big time rains came through and it was going to make the, 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 the prospecting area of a mess. Uh, the, the claim of land had yielded nothing yet, no gold, no precious stones, no anything. And he was just discouraged. He sent his son and some hired hands to go to work. Later that day, Jacobus hears a noise as he, as he hears somebody, sees somebody, excuse me, driving down the road fast. His son, whose name is Gert, by the way, Jacobus and Gert, I don't know what the rest of the family members' names are, don't know if I want to know, speeding home like a madman, according to the story screeching halt in front of the house, uh, leaping from his seat. The, the father comes and, and surely assumes something's bad happened. Was there an injury? Is there an accident? Is, is it worse? Instead of panic on his son's face, he sees a smile from ear to ear. He was just about to open his mouth to scold his son for reckless driving when his son placed an egg-sized stone in his hand. Although it was in a rough state, it was a 726 carat diamond found in the 
Elendovstein mine that he was in charge of. At the time, it was the fourth largest uncut gem ever found. In 1934, it was originally purchased for $312,000, which adjusted for inflation today would mean over $5 million. Now, um, we've been studying the book of Galatians as, and, and just as Jacobus, this became known as the Jonker Diamond, right? Um, you, just as he discovered this precious stone, Paul has been uh, helping and explaining to his dear friends in a region called Galatia about the ultimate treasure that is found, the freedom that is found, the surpassing worth that is found that only comes through Jesus. There's this special treasure, this thing you can't put a price tag on that comes with following Jesus. And Paul wants to remind some of his favorite people uh, to not drift and not get distracted from the truth that is found in Jesus. You see, these people in Galatia, they were getting confused. Paul had taught them about Jesus. And here's what he taught them, that, that Jesus plus nothing equals everything for your salvation. It's faith alone, uh, by grace alone and Jesus alone, that saves you. But false teachers had come in and said, hey, Jesus is good in everything, but you got to do works too. It's Jesus. He just didn't quite get it there. So your ability to keep the law, that's what's going to push you over into the finish line. And Paul reminds them that the, the law is like an x-ray. An x-ray only shows you the problem. It does nothing to fix the problem. And here's Paul's treasure that he wants them to, to hold tightly to, Jesus is the only one that can fix our problem. We all have it. It's called a sin problem. And when we start adding things to what Jesus did on the cross, we, get, we start getting everything wrong. You see, uh, we, we've been reminded as we study through Galatians, and Paul's given a few illustrations to help bring understanding between what the law is supposed to do, like keeping the rules and what Jesus did by, by extending us grace. Like, is it law or is it grace? Do I keep the rules or is it all about what Jesus did? And, and where do I fit in that? And here, here are a couple of, a couple of examples Paul has given. One is like the law weighs you down, but Jesus is the one that sets you free. The law is like a hard driving task master, but God is a, a good father that invites you into his family. The law is rigid and oppresses you and God sees you as a son or daughter and although he does discipline he disciplines in love the law leads us to the principles of this world but God sets us free from performance or a sinful past the law is like taking matters into your own hands but faith in Jesus is trusting that God's way is best now, what you'll see pop up on the screen here is you'll see an overview of, of Galatians. The first two chapters like confirms the truth of the gospel. Again, they were, they were confused. It, 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 man, we know what Paul taught us and man, we love that guy, but, but now these guys are teaching this and man, it kind of makes sense. And I see the struggle, like I should do stuff, right? And is it like, what, what, what should I do? So, so Paul reminds them, he confirms the truth of the gospel. Chapters three and four, Paul defends the superiority of the gospel. Jesus is better. Following Jesus is better. And then chapter five and six, where we start today, talks about the freedom of the gospel and how do I live in it? What the next couple chapters, what does it really look like to live like you trust Jesus? If there's a one word summary of Galatians, it's freedom. Now, a typical view of freedom for us here in America would be this always being able to do whatever I want to do and never having to do something I don't want to do. Don't fence me in. I want freedom. I'm never saying no to a desire. Freedom is I can do whatever I want. And we kind of want freedom. Galatians is talking about freedom and Paul is talking about freedom in Jesus. Well, what does that mean? And where is true freedom found really? Because if you were to follow around somebody that really does everything they want, they might just be the least free person that you know. John 8, 36 says, so if the son sets you free, talking about Jesus, you will be free indeed. Biblical freedom, what we will look at here in Galatians 5, and it begins to unpack for us over the next handful of weeks. What does freedom really look like? What would it look like for me to be free in my life? Jot this principle down. Freedom is not the ability to do what I want to do. It's the power to do what I should do. Freedom really, biblically, is not just do whatever I want. Freedom is 
Now I'm free to do the right thing. I'm free to, uh, to make the good choice. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a slave to, the Bible calls, it, apart from Jesus, we're a slave to sin. Uh, I'm only consumed with what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it. It doesn't really matter how it impacts anybody, but, but Jesus comes along and says, I'm going to set you free to a, something better than that. So freedom from what? You'll see a couple things on your screen. One is freedom from works-based Christianity. That God's love for you is not based on how you perform. God loves you. He does. Now, should you obey? Absolutely. The Bible calls us to obedience. No question. But Galatians 2.16 says, Yet we know that a person is not justified. Quick time out. Justification is God seeing me just as if I've never sinned and as if I've always obeyed. It's to be made right. It's to be for, for accounts uh, to, be, to be made even. I'm, I'm justified before God. A person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. So we get set free, big picture, from works-based faith. The law is like the x-ray. It just shows you what's broken, but it doesn't fix anything. Jesus is the only one that can really fix us in the areas of our life that need to be fixed. We also get, these are examples from Galatians. One is works-based Christianity. The other one is sin. Paul had a sin, the guy writing this letter to people he knows and loves had a sinful past. Man, this guy was the worst of the worst. He calls himself the chief of sinners. If you think you're bad, probably weren't as bad as this guy. Well, we get set free from that according to the power that works through Jesus in our life. James 1, 14 through 15, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. You get set free from that when you trust in Jesus. Another example of something we get set free from that we see here in Galatians are the, what, was, what are referred to in Galatians as the principles of this world. 1 John chapter 2 says, don't love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, it's not from the Father, it's from the world. All the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Where does this freedom come from? It comes from Jesus. What do we get set free from? Things just like that. That's what Paul's been saying for four chapters. Now he says, hey, guess what? Here's what it's all, here's what it's all for. Here's how it practically works itself out in your life. Look at verse one. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Stand firm in your freedom stand firm in who god says you are we've learned already you are a child a son or daughter an heir you're in god's family see god the right way see yourself the right way in light of who god is in your life it's god that does the great work through what jesus did on the cross see god the way see yourself excuse me the way god sees you you are set free it's for freedom that christ has set us free you're set free so you can live your life in that freedom. Stand firm in it. Don't submit again to the yoke of slavery. See yourself the way God sees you. It reminds you of the great work that he did. This is the principle. When the opinion of the one who matters most matters most to you, that's when you're really free. You are created for and set free for freedom in Christ. Verse 2, look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, hold on to that, we'll come back to that in a second, Christ will be of no advantage to you. So remember, this was an issue we talked about at the beginning of Galatians. Like the people, these false teachers were teaching the people in Galatia, Jesus is good and everything, but just not quite good enough, so keep the law, especially circumcision. 
Now, circumcision was a symbol of a covenant between God and the nation of Israel. It was a reminder that they were set apart, a reminder that that sin nature gets passed on through the, the through our human seed, um, a reminder of our need for forgiveness. It's just a constant reminder and outward. The belief, though, the danger here is that believing that an outward action can put you in right standing before God. It literally says Christ will be of no advantage to you. If you are trusting Christ in the law for salvation, what Jesus did will profit you nothing. You're either looking to Jesus or you're looking to yourself. You don't need to add anything to what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus does not need your help for your salvation. He can handle it. He did handle it. Matthew 11 verses 28 through 30 says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Don't submit again to the yoke of slavery. We know what a yoke is. It's it's used to keep two, maybe in in, in a farming scenario, it was used to keep two animals together that that were pulling a plow. It it restricts, it it, it ties down, it burdens down. It's the weight of... um, uh, uh, the, the taskmaster that's driving you forward, don't submit to that. That's what, that's what Paul is reminding us. Verse three, I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. What he's saying is, uh, if, you, if, you, uh, if, you, if you trust the law, then you've got to keep all of it. We're doing something here that we weren't designed, uh, that, that we're, we're, we're putting ourselves under a weight that we weren't designed to carry. Um, I've heard it said this way, if you're trusting the law, no amount of obedience makes up for disobedience. So if I break one law, I'm guilty of the whole thing. And uh, Paul's reminding us that, that we're not meant to carry that weight. Jesus took that weight for us on the cross. So place your faith and trust in him. Verse four, you are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. I mean, that's a, that's a bold statement. I, I want us to push pause here just for a second. When it talks about being severed or falling away from grace, it's not a question of whether you can lose your salvation. Okay, this is Paul's not suggesting with these couple of words or phrases that salvation can be lost. Um, Matter of fact, the Bible speaks of something like that more this way. It's not a question of whether you could lose your salvation. It's a question of whether you were saved to begin with. Um, Falling from grace does not mean Paul is saying you can lose your salvation, but what he is saying is you can turn your back on grace. That's what you must be careful of. You will either come to God based on what you've done or you will come to God based on what Jesus has done for you. You can't have it both ways. Um, and and, and when, I, when, I, when I serve God this way, uh, it, it, it changes everything, right? It's, it's uh, I don't want to fall away from grace. I want to hold on to grace. And and again, the tension could be, well, man, if I'm all about grace, then where does the law fit? If God loves me, it doesn't really matter what I do, then why does it matter what I do? And, and that's something to make sure that we are mindful of. And here's the way to think about this. If, if God really has changed my heart, because there is an exception in God's word for, for obedience. Um, you can't claim faith in Jesus and then your life not change. And here's where we get off a lot, is we like Jesus until it messes with what we want. And the danger could be, well, yeah, I go to church. I think I I did that right. I I have that kind of down. But nothing in my life is reflecting that Jesus saved me. Then the question would be, are you ever saved to begin with? And and we don't have to fear, um, well, I'm resting in grace, so I don't have to worry about the law. Well, I'm resting in grace, but that means I should obey, right? Um, I said it this way, that serving God, right? Service motivated by love is very different from service motivated by fear. Okay, like when I see God the right way, it doesn't lead me to a sinful life, it leads me to a holy life. If I see God for who he really is and what he's really done in my life and how Jesus really did save me, it should motivate me to follow him and live a life for him, not motivate me to take advantage of that love and grace. Right? We're getting it twisted. If that's what we're doing, we have a misunderstanding of God's grace. We don't really understand it to begin with. Look at verse 5 and 6. 
For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love or expressing itself through love. Hope and love. That's what we see in verses 5 and 6. Two characteristics of biblical freedom, hope and love. We wait for the hope of righteousness. We, the, the only thing that counts, verse 6, is faith expressing itself through love. I thought it was interesting that the word hope in the Greek means certainty. It's very different. When we use hope today, usually it's used to express uncertainty most of the time. I don't know. You're going to be able to do that. I don't know. I hope so. Well, hey, can we, can we get together? I don't know. Yeah, I hope so. Let's, let's see what we can work out. The Greek word means absolute certainty. When I trust in Jesus, I can be absolutely certain about my future, about my identity, about my standing before God. And when I do something good, it's an expression of God's love in my life, not me hoping God loves me more. When I do something bad, I can rest in God as my loving father, although he will discipline me, he's my loving father, not me hoping God doesn't find out. When I go through a hardship or a trial, I can rest in God's plan for my life, not me just hoping helplessly that everything will be okay. You see, God doesn't love you because you do good. You should do good because God loves you. Um, principle you might want to jot down is this. When you experience grace on the inside, you want to express grace on the outside. God changing your life through what Jesus did on the cross should motivate you to living a God-honoring life. It should not motivate you to take advantage of that love and grace. Okay, verses 7 through 12. You were running well. What hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view. And the, ones, the, the one who is troubling you will hear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross will be removed. I wish that those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. That's a pretty bold statement. Paul says something bold there. Here are the two principles. Write these things down. Paul's encouragement here. Stay focused on the truth of Jesus and stay focused on grace. Don't let, don't let any teaching, any for any, any instruction in your life that pulls you away from what Jesus taught is false. That's what Paul is saying. Hey, stand on this hill of who Jesus is. Because if we get Jesus wrong, we get everything wrong. And Paul's saying, don't you dare forget. You stay focused on the truth of Jesus. Stay focused on grace. You were running well, but something hindered you. And, and Paul's got something for those that, that hindered. A couple things though. Stay focused on the truth. Check out this verse, Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed or focused on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever. The Lord God is an everlasting rock. Be careful. Stay focused. Verse 9, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little bit off. Error increases with distance. So I have to get a little bit off and I allow myself to stay a little bit off. Next thing I know, then my life is at a place where I'm not honoring God anymore. I'm saying stuff. I'm doing stuff. I'm prioritizing things that don't honor God. I'm giving my life over to things that, that, that aren't appropriate. If I stay off just a little, I'll end up way far from where I know I need to be. Paul says some strong words there. Verse 12. If we get Jesus wrong, we get everything wrong. And again, we, circumcision is the answer. We, 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 we know medically what that is, but it's like Paul is saying, being cut off from Jesus is worse than having everything cut off. If we get Jesus wrong, we get everything wrong. If we embrace a works-based faith, we're cutting ourselves off from Jesus. Be warned, do not do that. Nothing good comes when we drift away from Jesus. Remember that diamond I talked about at the beginning just a few minutes ago? The Jonker diamond? I mean, at the time, $312,000 would be equal to over $5 million today. The family should have been set for, for life, right? Jacobus, Gert, the family, the whole diamond mine, all of those things should be okay. 
But the true story of the famous Jonker Diamond doesn't end with perpetual fame and fortune. Within a few years, Jacobus Jonker again found himself penniless. Having mismanaged his funds, he found himself once again combing the earth, hoping to find another treasure to restore his fortune, a great treasure wasted. And Paul wants to make sure that the Galatians do not waste the greatest treasure ever given, freedom in Christ. And he would want the same for us too. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for what we see in your word, the truth of who Jesus is and what he did and what that means to us. So help us now to live that truth, to live. It's for freedom that we've been set free. So help us to live and be set free from a works-based faith, the sin that's in our life, Lord, just the, 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 the things that can pull us from, t from place to place and kind of weigh us down. Lord, just help us to be set free from um, all of those things that can weigh us down in our life and, and, and help us to stay focused on Jesus, focused on grace that can only be found through him. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks everybody for hanging out. We can't wait to see you again next time. Hey, your next step would be if you're in the area and you physically are able, come to an in-person service. We can't wait to see you then. God bless you. Have a great rest of your day. Hey everybody, Pastor John here. Just to take a quick moment as we do every single week to say thank you for your faithful consistent generosity. Um, it's the way ministry happens. It's uh, the way we get to uh, make an impact. One of the ways we get to make an impact, the reminder is that um, you don't just give to a church, you give to God through a church. And on the other side of your generosity are changed lives. And so one of the ways we just this past week, you'll see some pictures pop up. We had some amazing trunk or treat events. Can I just tell you so, some record numbers and, um, uh, uh, Although numbers aren't everything, each, each number represents a soul that we want to find hope in Jesus so we can go to heaven, so they can go to heaven. And if people are the only thing we can take to heaven with us, we want to take as many people as we possibly can. And so after our first one, because we did two of them, we flat had to restock everything. So we had to make a major candy run. We had to restock supplies. We had to make sure games were set up and ready to go. And, and we, can, we can move toward things like that much quicker and much easier when we know that uh, our church has been faithful to, to allow us to do those things with excellence. So just this past week, your generosity made a difference to thousands of people in our city and in the Permian Basin. And so thank you uh, for giving. Thank you for continuing to give. If you're not giving yet, you, I wanna encourage you to start because you can make a big time difference uh, with, uh, with what God's blessed you with. So thank you and God bless you as you give today. Thanks for being here today at Hope. Over the next few weeks, several different events are upcoming for you and your family. You can find signups for these different events in the back of the auditorium. Remember to mark them on your calendar. Starting today, we are collecting our Just Because bags to provide holiday meals for families in our community. This year, we have a goal of providing 200 bags. In each bag, you will find a shopping list to provide a complete meal. We will be collecting bags through December 8th, so grab a bag or two from the lobby today. Looking for a place to serve? On Thursday, November 7th, we have the opportunity to partner with Great House Elementary with Donuts with Dads. We will be able to serve both the families and faculty that morning. Sign up today to serve. Our Grief Share Ministry has a special event called Surviving the Holidays on November 13th at 6.30 p.m. in room F602. The holidays can be hard for anyone, and losing a loved one can make it even harder. This event will give you advice and encouragement for the holiday season. Please sign up in the back of the auditorium or go to griefshare.org to register. Ladies, mark your calendars for Mary and Bright on November 22nd. This is one of the largest ladies' events of the year. This night is designed for you to laugh, connect with other ladies, and be reminded of our hope in Jesus. You can purchase tickets today for $15 in the back of the auditorium or at hccmidland.com ladies. Once again, thank you for joining us today. We pray you have a great week and can't wait to see you again next Sunday.